welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. If I make a mistake on set, which I often do, I don't feel shame at all. I expect people to give me the right feedback to be like, this sucked, or I'm looking for it more like this. And I'm okay hearing that because no one sees the one that sucks. But that takes guts because you have, I have to fail in front of my crew. I have to fail in front of three cameras. But I'm not afraid to do that because I'm just searching for that one gem that's gonna be there. Hello, hello. Welcome to yet another episode of In the Envelope. I am your host, as always, Vinny Mancuso. And today, folks, we are asking the question, when you think of backstage, when you think of the craft of acting, do you think of professional wrestling? If not, we are here to challenge those preconceived notions. And when I say we, I do mean me and today's guest, John Cena. I'm so excited that John joined us literally in between wrapping one movie and then hopping on a plane for the next Fast and Furious movie. The guy does not stop. I love the guy. I've loved the guy since I was, uh, I don't know, 10 years old ordering WrestleManias in a New Jersey suburb. And I think by now the world knows that he is a grade A movie star. But I still think this conversation is going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, If you can walk away from this episode without respecting John Cena, not only as an artist, but just respecting his hustle, respecting his humbleness... I don't know what to tell you, so I'll I'll let him tell you. You can't see him, but he is here, John Cena. This podcast is, of course, brought to you by Backstage, the number one source for actors looking to get cast. That is probably you. If you're listening to In the Envelope, there's a pretty good chance you're an actor searching for your next gig. Friends, wonderful listeners, I've got some good news. Backstage is offering 30 days free just for you, our In the Envelope audience. 30 days, totally free. I'm a podcast host. I don't do math, but I do know 30 days for $0 is a pretty good deal. All you got to do is head over to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code word envelope at checkout. And boom, you have access to thousands of casting notices posted and updated every day. It's all totally filterable. Are you bilingual? Can you dance? Can you juggle? There's probably a gig in there for you somewhere. Just upload a headshot, start applying, and get that dream going. A lot can happen in 30 days, trust me. But first, you gotta subscribe. Get to it. John Cena is both figuratively and literally one of Hollywood's biggest stars. After spending more than a decade inside a wrestling ring, Cena made the leap to the big screen, landing firmly in most of our modern-day blockbuster franchises. His recent slate includes a Transformers prequel, the final chapters of the Fast and Furious saga, and his own corner of the DC Cinematic Universe with James Gunn's Suicide Squad and its spin-off series, Peacemaker. Here is the one and only John Cena. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I'm very, very very excited. As someone who, honestly, I ordered, I believe it was WrestleMania 21 uh, as a as a youth. Uh, This is I cannot believe I'm currently sitting in a my podcast studio, which is just my walk in closet and talking to you over Zoom. It's very uh, it's one of those surreal moments that I kind of can't really uh, does not feel like reality. So (laughs) that's that's where I'm at. That's a man. That's a nice thing to say. And uh, perspective is everything you say you uh watched wrestlemania 21 as a youth and that certainly makes me feel a little bit uh seasoned 
Right yeah, now. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't want. I didn't want to give you. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm an exact exactly. age, but <laughs> that's, that's uh, but that that truly is fantastic. Thank you. Of course, of course. Can I can I ask where what uh, you I guess cinematic universe you're in these days? I feel like you've been franchise hopping for the past I don't know five six eight years recently. What are you? Where are you? <laughs> what world are you currently calling in from? Um, I just finished. Uh, my little piece on a movie called um, Acme versus Coyote that they're mm-hmm. filming with uh, Will Forte out in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I have uh, two days at home and I'm literally going to do this interview with you and then pack my bag for London to get fast. <laughs> As we, I don't know whether market, marketing hasn't picked up on this, but we should fast 10 our seatbelts. Exactly. I mean, that's... Thank you so much. That should be the title. I feel like if I could, if I could get you to talk to somebody, uh, somebody in production to to get to work that up the ladder, that'd be great. I'd really appreciate that. You just heard me say it. I say we use your platform. Let's start. Let's start yes. everybody on the on the trend of fast Fine. ten year seatbelts. Finally, I can use my platform for some good. Get the message out there. Uh, there change, the, change the world. Um. Yeah. I. I. This is the backstage podcast, so we're we. I, I cannot wait to talk about you know Fast Ten, uh, Peacemaker, all your all your current projects. But we're we're also very interested in the whole journey, the A to B to C, the, how you got to this place. And for you, when we look back, I was you know I was just sort of looking through history, and I was going to start in the wrestling ring. But something I saw that I thought was really interesting um, is that you graduated with a degree in kinesiology. Um, yes which is the study, just the study of body movement. Um, yes. And I thought that was really interesting because I, I feel like you're a very graceful on-screen presence. You're very, very aware of your, of your, your physicality. You're very aware of your size, how you move. And I'm wondering if there's a through line there is, is, the, did you graduating with that degree? Did that, did that propel you through your career? Is that something, are you using that knowledge still to this day? Amazingly enough, I've never been called graceful in my life. So thank you. <laughs> this is the first time for everything. I, uh, I really got to a point where I tried to um, early on apply my degree in in fields like that were direct connections. I tried to get a job in the fitness industry, mm-hmm. um, in strength and conditioning, and I just came up short in every avenue. Um, and then when I was introduced to sports entertainment, WWE, it was a way for me to remain athletic. And the reason I chose kinesiology is because I loved working out and I wanted to go to college to play football. And I knew I wasn't going to do anything after that, but I at least wanted to get my four years of playing football in. And kinesiology not only uh, got me a degree, so my parents were happy, but it also learned, I learned a lot of, about how to take care of myself. So I, I have been using my college degree more than I ever would have imagined, especially, uh, you know, as somebody who tries to maintain good physical activity at 45 years old, but it's in, it's such indirect. Like I, I keep mm-hmm. uh, grabbing snippets from, from classrooms. It's crafted my training over the years, uh, certainly my recovery and, and um, you know, all the processes to get my body to move healthier. So it's something that I, I rely on a lot more than I thought I would. I thought I would be going to a four year school to play football and get a degree to make my parents happy. Can you remember when you look back on, you know, the, the, the different pivots <laughs> you've, you've taken, can you remember the moment where performance became the passion? Because I, I feel like, you know, it, it eventually that you were just, you know, you were g- progressing throughout your career. Can you remember the moment where you're like, Oh, you know what? Performance is where the track is. This is the track I'm going to stay on. I think career wise, it's safe to say when I found out that that was possible, mm-hmm. Uh, being from a very small town, um, you, you weren't exposed to a lot. And especially, I, my, my dad was really theatrical and uh, really, he still is to this day, uh, a showman. Um, I found out in, in digging deeper into my mom's story that she had been involved as well in, in, uh, in theater as a late teen, early 20 individual, and then had five of us. So she chose to, to be a mom and, instead very grateful for that um so you know i think the idea was kind of there before i was an idea and and uh my parents i think by just being grossly outnumbered also embraced our creativity a lot Mm -hmm. because it kept us busy you know i think uh, us 
making games or doing whatever, pretending we were sports icons. Or And my dad always loved watching uh, wrestling. We mm-hmm. would never watch sport. Like, I never had a catch with my dad. But we would always, like, beat the hell out of each other and watch every bit of wrestling that was on TV. Uh, AWA, NWA, WWE, at the, you know, at the time, Gorgeous Ladies Wrestling. I remember being able to stay up late to watch Saturday Night's main event, Gorgeous mm-hmm. Ladies Wrestling. So that was always a through line. Um, I did one piece of drama in high school called that championship season. And it was pushed on me. And I'm very grateful that it was by a teacher named Whit Wales. And he took a bunch of unlikely performers and turned them into performers. And we did a very small side stage show for 20 people. And uh, he, he kind of saw something in me at an early age that I never revisited until you know i, I kind of made my way in the wwe but the um i, I got a taste of, of that and i've always wanted to bring people together you know as a team captain i was responsible for getting the team motivated and that could be between you know um, giving them brave heart type fire up speeches or doing something absolutely foolish to get them to laugh through double session practices so uh i always kind of had the bravery to try and fail at those things. I don't want to say I was any good, but I always had the bravery to at least try. And then when I found out right before I was going to join the Marine Corps, I kind of was out of options and wanted to stay in California. Uh, a friend of mine said that he was trained to be a wrestler. And I, I was, had fallen back in love with sports entertainment, with the Monday Night Wars. We talked about it often and I went to go train. And the rest is a, is a weird journey of pivots. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned, you know, how your dad not only fostered creativity, but he loved to watch wrestling. Cause I it's something I a memory I have is 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 actually from watching the the what I mentioned, WrestleMania 21, is I, I was watching it with my father and he he's a theater teacher. He's he's his entire life he's been he's been in the theater, but he had that sort of hang up on professional wrestling that a lot of people do. And I will never forget him turning to me and he's just said, Oh, it's theater. Oh, this is it's just theater. That that realization that that it's 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 performance in the round. And I'm wondering if you had to have that that moment where that kernel of performance that you were given in that original high school performance, did 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 you, did you have a moment where you, where you were training to wrestle and you said, Oh, you know what? This is just this is just theater. I'm just I'm just projecting like I did before into a new medium. Actually, for me, it was a lot less um professional. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I I had wrestling leagues with my brothers in our basement and like we really enveloped our personalities and characters there's an iconic shot of me holding a paper championship belt that i've made for myself Mm -hmm. at a very at a very young age so i think if i had to professionally connect the dots because it wasn't really on my list of like aspirational things to do i think my story would be different Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was because i got to do what I was doing as a kid anyway for free and they were paying me for it. Mm-hmm. And I really, I really didn't want that to end. So that's what, I mean, I really, really enjoyed it. I was doing it anyway. I was into it anyway. I was working for then, you know, in, in 2000, what I, what I believed and still believe is one of the greatest companies in the world to work for. And I just thought it was a dream come true. Like this isn't supposed to happen to someone like me. So I just, uh, you know, it, it became, it became my, my football. I was really obsessed with playing football. And a lot of that was maybe, you know, you could search for maybe parents approval or people I looked up to. I wanted to show them that I could, but either way, I put my heart and soul into it. And this became my new football. And suddenly football was a, just an afterthought and it became, you know, my path and, and essentially my family. It's, it's interesting. Cause you, we've, you know, you mentioned that that sort of unreality of I this I can't believe this is happening to me. This isn't something that happens to people. And you mentioned you, you said the words I, I I don't want this to end. Is that sort of still the drive all these years later? Is is the drive from one job to the next? Like I can't believe this is happening to me, and I need I need to maintain I need to make sure this does not end. So that perspective has changed a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the gratitude has not. I am about to hopefully kiss my mom before I head to London. So I'll be able to go up to West Newbury and see her for a few minutes. And uh, her, my family, my circle of friends, uh, my loving wife, 
I, I'm, <laughs> they, they do their best to, to keep me grounded. And I, I do my best each day to live each day grateful. I think every day you can wake up, uh, life is the, is the greatest gift of all. And the fact that I get opportunities to do stuff that I enjoy, I know that that's a pretty narrow percentage of folks. So I'm grateful for that. I think me not wanting it to end as a young person was, I don't want this to end prematurely so people can't see what I do. Mm -hmm. So I don't give this my full chance. So now instead of looking over my shoulder for things that'll go wrong, because I've had so many, I've been lucky enough to, to have opportunity and, and lucky enough to have a, a wonderful career with the WWE. The, I don't want this to end phase is a lot, a lot more subdued and it's a lot more uh, being present and enjoying things, taking a look around to like, man, I got to film with Will Forte and I mm -hmm. was able to shake his hand and say, dude, you made me laugh so much in my life. And laughter is a great medicine to cure whatever the hell's bringing me down. Your work has affected my life in a positive way. Not only can I meet you, but we're about to perform together. How fucking cool is that? So it's, it's, more, it's more things like that. It's more things to be able to, to shake hands with Vin Diesel and give him a hug and tell him that I, I saw the first fast and was moved. And then I was fired up when the Charger came back in Tokyo Drift. And I know what it, what it feels like to be a member of the family. And like, that's as a fan. And you just, you just took me over the barricade and into the ring in, in my vocabulary. And that's not lost on me, but I'm not looking around over my shoulder thinking that, you know, I'm going to sabotage myself. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable enough to know that if I do enough homework and I prep, I'll be able to give my all and, some, some things will hit, some things will miss. That is a lesson you learn very quickly in the WWE. You bomb a lot and sometimes you, you make good stuff and you got to be able to move forward and always keep moving forward. I just think as a young performer, it's maybe because I was underqualified. I didn't come from the independent circuit. Um, I also wasn't the best athlete. Keep in mind, my, my graduating class was Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, Dave Batista. So like that's, that is an unbelievably gifted athletic scope right there. So I'm not the best athlete. I don't have um, a wrestling background resume. I guess I just didn't want to be misjudged or uh, I didn't want the opportunity taken away from me before I could say I gave it my all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. And when, you know, when I look back on <laughs> when I was just sort of charting your evolution through these things, so I think the fascinating thing is that the, the, the character Again, air quotes, the character you're probably most recognized for is, again, air quotes, John Cena. I think yeah, it's, 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 very, it's, it's fascinating that, that the, the character you played is, shares your name, but it's a character. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious how, um, I, I don't even know how to put this, how you, how you uh, have dealt with that over the years, how, how, how you've separated the fact that you're playing a character, but that character is named John Cena, and, but that's not you, John Cena. Well, so it's gone in phases. Um, when you're starting out, you don't care. You want as many people to know as possible. And, and I started out with a very clearly defined hip hop persona and everything that I did from, you know, battle rapping kids in parking lots to local radio promotion to any event you saw me at to my personality in WWE. If you saw me in an airport or a hotel, like you saw the John Cena on television. And then your schedule gets busier and busier and you don't yet have uh, the wisdom you do towards the, you know, the middle and the end of the journey. And there, at least for me, there was a point where I thought I, I thought I was entitled to lead two different lives. Mm -hmm. I thought I was entitled to be left alone. And I'm so, we talked about gratitude earlier. I'm so grateful that period was brief. It was, I, I'm, I'm confident in saying it was probably less than, than 12 months. And then I came to the realization that, no, this is the trade-off for being able to be in something that I is a dream come true. But I, I approached every individual 
reaction or interaction with respect. If someone were to treat me disrespectfully, I would treat them with that respect, hopefully to give them a sense of awareness of what's going on. A great example of this was when uh, this happens often when people ask you for pictures in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. This is this is a tough one. Uh, so it used to be a little more, I used to be a little more abrasive because I just couldn't understand why people couldn't understand that it was a bathroom. And I'm, you know, once again, grateful now at 45 and still be being able to perform and still being accepted in the WWE community and now being accepted in a film and television community, both scripted and unscripted. And man, I don't even know how to, how to quantify all that, but my approach is a lot more empathetic now. And I don't care how people, it's almost weird. It's gone back full circle. I don't care how people know John Cena. Mm -hmm. Even if, even if it's in a negative connotation, it's very similar to the reaction I had to, to Will Forte. Like your work has affected my life. And if someone, if someone approaches me in a disrespectful manner, they really have to be bad for me to, to get stern because I, I don't think, um, I think anyone who hears anything can kind of read the room. And if people don't listen to you that I think they should be, they should get a a small dose of, of general awareness. Like maybe you should, you should listen a little bit more and that's okay. But I try to be a lot more empathetic towards people because basically all they're trying to say is, Hey, what you did affected me in a certain way. And I connected to that. And I know their connection may run deeper. You've been, you, you said you watched WrestleMania 21. I don't know how long you've been watching WWE, but if you have been watching a long time, let's say from 21 to 30, I've been in your house every week for 10 years. There's no way that you can't feel as if you don't know me. You don't know all of me. And I think sometimes, you know, people get frustrated with there's more of me to give. It's why I don't. It's why I love the invisible jokes. It's why I love the memes (laughs) <laughs> like all that stuff, any, yeah. any, any reaction says that like, Hey, something you did affected my life. But I will tell you that took me a long, a long road to get to. And I've been, I always say I've been, I've been truly blessed with the amount of time I've been able to do this because if it was like an, an athlete career, like the average career in the NFL is three years, if it was three years or five years, I wouldn't have time to properly learn from my mistakes. I'm still making mistakes every day, but I really, I'm trying real hard to not only have a a great perspective on what I do, but also try to put myself in other people's shoes. Well, I was going to ask how it also, how it affected both how you learned how to build a character and how you still approach building a character. Cause it almost feels like I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, uh, around the fact that you were for years tweaking the character of John Cena. So it's, it, it, did it ever feel like you were adding layers to yourself? Were you, or did it feel like it was affecting your, your public persona? Did it feel like when you made changes to the character, you were also had to make changes to you as a person? Well, the, you know, WWE and sports entertainment walks that gray line. Like everyone knows it's entertainment, everyone, but everyone wants to believe in what's going on. You know, they don't ask, even even the the most iconic superhero characters, they do they're they're known for their performances, but they do get to step away. Mm-hmm. There is a clear cut difference in WWE. The the audience doesn't want that. They don't, and and that's what keeps them coming back. And that's you know what 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 keeps the thing the train on the tracks. And that's that's part of it. So um, I was I was definitely made aware that I would not undergo a tectonic shift in John Cena, the character Mm -hmm. Uh, around probably around 2009. So that allowed me to get that conversation off the board. And I had to, or I chose to dive into nuance. And that's a, that's a very accurate question. Yes. If I was going through something in my life, it's a lot easier for me to take from that and put those nuances into a performance. And I don't, I don't think I'm alone there. I think a lot of actors use that process of taking upon their emotions, their core emotions that they feel at a certain time and then projecting that on screen. I just, I just got so familiar with the character. I could either be bored and do the same thing, or I could dive into really small things. And even when the audience said that I was doing the same thing, I knew the changes were so subtle 
that they wouldn't see it today, they wouldn't see it tomorrow, they wouldn't see it in a month, but they would see it over the years. And they would see the, the it, like truly like the fault lines, just inching along, inching along, inching along. And it's, it's that long, boring process, but I don't have 90 minutes to let you know how I feel. I'm, I'm, I'd like to say I, I'm going to be a part of the WWE family for life. So I got a story to tell for as long as I'm around. Well, that's, that's very fascinating because, you know, not a lot of performers, you know, get the chance to tell this, tell a character story over the course of God, I, I, decades. So I, I, I'm wondering what the adjustment was like for you when you made the leap to TV and to film, when you were per, taking on a character for a very finite amount of time, was, was there an adjustment period where it was like, you got to, there, there is no adjustment here. You you need to give us this character in, like you said, ninety minutes in two hours. There, uh, there sure was, and that was a lot of <laughs> a lot of failure and a lot of stuff that was uh, that people didn't want to see. And once again, I'm not I'm not professionally qualified. I have like street sense or guerrilla training and everything uh, that that comes to marketing and promotion and branding, um, performing in front of a live audience, like acting. All all my all of my education is from people that I can learn from, not, not in a formal classroom and, and not because it was like, you know, I chose it as a career path at a young age. Like uh, I've just kind of learned as I go. And, and those, those curves are harsh sometimes. And there's a lot of failure there. Uh, but if you can just hang around and learn from every mistake, I think you can get better. And I wasn't self-aware enough to realize that I was, doing what I was doing with the, with the character in WWE. I was just familiar with it. It was comfortable for me. So because it was comfortable and because my audience knew me, I knew the boundaries of chances I could take. And I would test those. I would keep reaching uh, farther and farther. But I couldn't conceptualize a shift to television and screen. And where I found my comfort zone was parodying myself in like the Fred movies. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, being on shows with an audience, doing the monologue for the ESPYs, being a, being a co-host on the Today Show, um, any, anything, even in front of a small studio audience, because even a small studio audience was a chance to work a room, but I could do it in the Clark Kent version of the Superman John Cena character. And it became different and I became a little more confident. And I think everyone has their own process and, and no one of them is wrong. But for me, I think it just, the greatest strides I've taken have been be confident in your abilities. You have had the chance to say no to this at one time and you've said yes. So you are committed. Mm -hmm. be, com be confident to the people around you because they're there for a reason and trust in them that they don't want to do bad because very few of us want to get into something to do bad at it. So if, if you lean on the folks around you and you can learn from the folks around you and you're confident in yourself, if, if I make a mistake on set, which I often do, I don't feel shame at all. I expect people to give me the right feedback to be like, this sucked or I'm looking for it more like this. And I'm okay hearing that because no one sees the one that sucks. You, everybody sees the good one or the one that they feel is the best one, the most passable one. So but that takes guts because you have, I have to fail in front of my crew. I have to fail in front of three cameras. I have to maybe waste some time or take some more time. I have to fail in front of my castmates and, and all, all the people behind the camera. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not afraid to do that because I'm just searching for that one gem that's going to be there. And, and so many things from the WWE have helped me. That was the one thing that hurt me being so comfortable in one character. But so many things have helped. The WWE is a giving business. You cannot be selfish. You are only as good as the person you're in there with or the people you're in there with. And by the way, the crowd is, is one of those people. So you also have to give to them. We as fans have seen so many matches where the crowd is going bananas, having no, saying nothing to do with what's going on in the match. And the, the performers aren't recognized in the audience and the audience tunes out. And then there's silence and nobody's interested. And these guys and gals could be killing themselves by the physical things that they do, but no one is interested because they didn't give. They weren't giving enough. They were too, too selfish. I want to do the things I want to do, and you guys are going to pay attention. 
That's not how the industry works. You go out there in front of 10,000 people and they have energy and you have to give and then they give back and then you give more and you give back and then somebody else comes out and there's a match and it's, it's, it's all being able to just give. And that, that taught me that it's okay to give and it's okay to let other people be great because if other people are great, you'll also be great. So when you, when you mix all that stuff up and uh, add just a, just a sprinkle of a little bit of wisdom that I've gotten for failing for 20 years now, I, I feel just much more confident when I undertake a project. And I, I also think it starts with the fact that I say yes to it, which means I know what I'm getting myself into. It's, it's just very fascinating to hear uh, an actor talk about how there's they you still don't feel professionally qualified for for things because it is it is just you know the learning never stops i think that that's the the lesson that most people bring to this conversation is you know the learning never stops i'm, I'm curious when you at what point do you feel comfortable like you do you feel like you've got something down when whether it's wrestling acting a, a specific role what what makes you feel like okay i have I have this, I have this, I, I know how to do this. I said yes to this. And now I'm glad I said, I'm glad I said yes to this. Well, I, as a storyteller, I think for me, it starts with excitement of the story. And that's why I won't say yes until I read it. And that's, that's, um, that's sometimes a difficult hurdle with me because stuff will be in development. That sounds nice. and sounds great, but I, I know what, I, where I'm deficient and I know where my strengths are. And, and someone's perspective of what my strengths are may not be in line with what I think I can offer. So I like to read it. Uh, when I, I always, man, I got the 10,000 hours over at WWE. So I always go back to that when they say, Hey, this is your opponent. This is the amount of time you have. And if they don't give me a story, the first thing I do is rack my brain. I don't care at all about the physical choreography. I try to answer the question, why are we fighting? And the answer to be the best is not acceptable. There has to be something more. There has to be a core root. There has to be a story. And you get to a story that you both love. So then you go out there and fight for your side of the story. And that's what makes the performance great. So if I read a script and I'm throttled by it, and I just, I love the story, and I feel it as if I can contribute to the story, it also doesn't matter what, what they want me for. They could be a, a small part, walk across the screen and say hi, or it could be, you know, you, the one with your name on the marquee. I think it, for me, at least, it comes down to, to loving the material. And then it goes to the next level of, well, is this with, with good folks? And sometimes, you know, sometimes I may take a gamble on the, on the groups, but I, I very rarely nowadays... I just can't do anything that I can't resonate with. And I don't have some sort of connection. I just, I just filmed a movie freelance in Columbia and I've always wanted to do another Marine mm -hmm. because so many folks talk to me about the Marine. I, I can't believe it. And it was initially yeah. some, something that I'm, I wasn't really proud of because that that's a situation where I look back and say, I didn't give my all because I was commuting back and forth from Australia to SmackDown and I really, as a young man, I wanted to be in the middle of the rock star life, man. I wanted to be in front of those sold out crowds. And then I get to a quiet movie set where everything takes forever. And I just didn't have the wisdom or the knowledge or the perception to realize how big of an opportunity it was. But come hell or high water, a lot of folks watched it. A lot of, hey, man, I saw you in the Marine. And I read this script freelance, which, which is, a, is a thrilling action three-hander that we filmed in Columbia. It was I, I can't wait to see it because when I read it, I was so connected to it about like, yo, this is John Triton 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, this is, this is kind of what I'm looking for. And this is my chance to play 20 years later, John Triton. Like, this is exactly it. And like the whole, my whole little piece of the story. And the, I mean, you can hear how excited I'm, I'm talking about it now. And it was one of those things where it, people always ask me what I'm looking to do. I have no clue. Cause if you're asking me like, Hey, you looking for a, you know, three-hander action movie that you want to film in the jungle? Nope. But they, I always read it. I read, I try to read everything. And this is one of those things. It's like, yo, this is a chance to, to do that. And I think that's the approach I'm going to take to that. And that seems cool. That seems fun. And those made the tough days on set and the, you know, the, the arduous thing about making a movie, the process, it made it fun. 
I, I have to assume just by, you know, by virtue of who you are, by the type of roles, by the type of franchise you've been in, that you've been, and we don't have to break any NDAs here, but I, I have to assume that you've been close to a lot of roles that, like you said, you've, you, you care about the material a lot. It's something you're excited about. And then maybe you're, it's down to five people, three people, two people, and it goes to someone else. I'm curious sure. what the process is. Or you know just what it what it is to to let that material go because it you can clearly tell when you're talking about freelance how excited you are about that role and I have to assume that you get that excited about roles like sometimes that you don't get I'm wondering what it's like to let that go eventually. So I think a lot of it has to deal with expectations, and and the entertainment business and this is um, only from my perspective, but the entertainment business is a business of failure. It is, it is a hitter in Major League Baseball and, and not a Hall of Famer. Um, you're you're going to swing 10 times and hit two, you know, and that's just, that's it. And that's, that's through all entertainment. I tell you, like, I've, I've bombed out there in WWE and you, you can't dwell on it. And, and I've also had rumblings of fantastic matches that never come to fruition. Um, I think it's all in the matter of expectations. Wanting to be a part of something is great. Thinking you're a part of it before you are is dangerous. Because if you, if you see yourself doing this thing and that's part of your prep, that's fine. But if, if you're making choices out of your control, that's, that's dangerous. And that, that can lead to some high highs, but it's also going to lead to some low lows. And, and I think um, managing expectations for me is a great way for the fish to to get away, but also understanding you're in a business of failure. And I, I talked to a lot of people about that. Like every movie you make, you think is going to be great. If that were the case, theaters would be packed all the time. Wi-Fi signals would be jammed 24 seven. Cause I mean, I know people are streaming a lot and they're seeing a lot, but every movie isn't a hit. There's a, there's a select few that really leave their mark, but a lot of stuff is just out there for us to consume and, and hopefully enjoy. So you, you gotta, when you get it, you gotta, you gotta love it. You gotta give your all to it for sure. Or else you look back at the Marine like me thinking, man, if I'd only, and we're talking about something, you know, uh, 15, 16 years ago, 20 years mm -hmm. ago. And that, that's my, but that was my takeaway from that. Invest everything into what you have. That's, that's why, I mean, insurance plays a role, but that's why I don't bounce back and forth anymore. Because I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that to the WWE audience. I was fully committed to them for as long as I could be. And I think that they appreciate and respect that. And now I'm trying to learn a new craft. And I'm trying to get comfortable in a new craft. And I can't split atoms because all things are going to suffer. Uh, my wrestling would suffer. My performance would suffer. My performance on screen would suffer. And in trying to do everything, I'd do nothing at all. But in, in letting material go away, I think, for me at least, I think a lot of it is about expectations. You don't want to coach yourself out of it. You don't want to get yourself in a negative headspace. But I don't, I don't think I ever think I have it until I have it. It doesn't make me give any less. I just think it keeps it realistic. And for the, you know, it, it, it's, it's incredible because the, the amount, like we, I, mentioned that, I mentioned this at the beginning that you, you just feel like you are hopping from franchise to franchise and you're hopping from gigantic set to gigantic set. I'm curious what the creative constant is between every gigantic movie you've ever done. Cause I, I feel like, cause I've, you know, I've seen franchise sets. I know they, they can look like a small army and they don't on the outside. They don't look like something that's very personally creative, even though there's a hundred different people doing a hundred different creative jobs on it. I'm wondering what the constant is for you. What's something that the best big sets have in common that make them run correctly. Same as the small sets, opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to perform. And if you take it as what it is, okay, this is this big packaged globo thing where I'm, I don't even have a say. And that's your perspective. Well, that's how it's going to be. But you, I mean, you, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for saying hopping from, from one uh, giant production to the other. <laughs> uh, aside from Peacemaker, now one of those is my name on the marquee mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I don't need, I'm not trying to muscle my way up the depth chart or whatever. I enjoy, and I'm grateful for each opportunity. 
or whether it's uh, playing a military strategist in Bumblebee or uh, being the, the brother of Don Toretto in Fast or being a character who gets killed in the Suicide Squad and in a character ensemble of 25 actors is, you know, I got on screen, but it's a character ensemble of 25 actors. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So I don't worry about the economics. That stuff is so beyond my control. Those are, those are great things to be part of because you have resource and resource can solve a lot of problems. It can create a lot of problems, but it can also solve a lot of problems. And I think that's advantageous a lot. And a lot, sometimes it, you know, it has its negative effects, it's positive and negative to everything. But I think a large set offers the same as a small set. It's opportunity. I just, like I said, I, I just did a coyote versus acne and I'm, the role I have, I was just so excited for. I loved the script, but it, someone took a chance and said, I see you as more than what you're doing. You probably won't say yes to this, which they're probably using psychology on me, but uh, <laughs> read it and see what you think. And before that, in, in December, I got to fly to New York and do a small film called The Independent, mm-hmm. which, I, which I'm very proud of because you know a director took a chance on me and, and, and said, I, I see you as this. And I think you'd be great as this. And it doesn't matter what your, how big your arms are or, or what you, what you look like. We're, you know, we're going to, we're going to put you in a different look and we're going to make you, you be different. Can you do that for us? And I was like, hell yeah. A chance to do a different character. Yes, absolutely. So I don't look at it like that. I mean, uh, you just, it's literally just a matter of how much resource you got at your disposal. You mentioned how big your arms are. Cause, cause John, you're, you're a very large person. You're a very muscular person. And I think that's what, what people see right at the beginning. But when I, when I originally said that you're very aware of your size at the beginning, when I said that you're a very graceful performer, I think, and this especially applies to Peacemaker, I think what I find fascinating about you as a uh, performer is how you sort of use your size to build character. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not just a way to fill the frame. It's, it's almost, and with Peacemaker, it's almost a subversion of, of what you would expect. And I think that that's, very interesting. And I'm curious how much of that has gone into the way you approach roles and how you approach characters. Because I, I, I think that it's not something that you see ev- from every big blockbuster star, the, that, that subversion of what it is to be a large muscular man. Well, again, I think it comes from the material mm-hmm. and certainly uh, conversations with the with the person leading the charge and that's the director. If you have a role where they need what a typical, I, I, I hate using the word typical because I, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to use the wrong word here, but if they, if they have a very judgmental part on what they think a large person should be, mm-hmm. well, you know, you, you lean into all the, the preconceived stereotypes and what I liked about Peacemaker is maybe this guy has gotten in shape so much for reason X mm-hmm. and, and underneath it is this core thing, or maybe he did it because of this and this, because he's um, socially inept or, or having struggles at home or, you know, like I started lifting weights at 12 years old as a form of self-defense because I got the crap kicked out of me all the time. And I didn't, uh, you know, when I started getting sizable gains at 15, I didn't become a meathead. I was like a, a, a weird uh, meathead nerd hybrid. <laughs> so like, I guess I understand I was, you know, I was never really one of the cool kids. So I, I can understand where you would want to lean into that term if the role were to dictate for it, but it's, it's not who I am as a human being. It's not what I strive to be as a human being. Uh, I know time is undefeated and, you know, my physique is, is going to fade out. So I, I love, I love being active. I love working out. It's if it's part of the fabric of my life. And as a byproduct, you, you look okay, you move okay. That's all good. But I think if you can get to the why, I think that's special. And, and a lot of times you can add dimension, even, even in a small character, um, like the one in train wreck, mm-hmm. it's, you know, I think that was originally written to just be a physically demanding scene. So you needed a physically imposing person to execute physically demanding sex. But then when they, the small amount of dialogue that was in there, I got to the why, well, why does this person want a committed relationship? 
He spends a lot of time at the gym. He spends a lot of time around his male friends. Maybe he wants a committed relationship because he really isn't sure about who he is from a, a sexual perspective and is trying to follow those paths and trying really hard, but maybe he's broken on the inside or maybe he is something he's not. And a whole vast array of comedy or potential comedy comes from just that one idea. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you talking? Why are you so upset that this is a breakup? Um, and that's just one angle to go. You could, you could attack that from, from many, many different angles. But why, why is Peacemaker such a dick? Because he feels he needs to be because that's the corner he's painted his identity into. And he really isn't. And he really is someone who really wants a, a, a group of people to love and to love him back. But he has to be a dick because that's, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. That's the way he can show he's strong in front of his dad. There's a lot more there. You can just keep asking questions if you want. I, I, to me, that's a lot of, of my process is, is get to the why. And if, if the why is simply, I, I need you to be big. Mm -hmm. that's okay that's fine because that's that's cut and dry but if 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 you're willing to to peel off more and we can get to what the core of why you why you're so physically fit then you can have some substructure and then you can really wow people because you're right you can't deny it's tough to deny a first impression and that's why it's been very difficult for me to to try to to seek out new levels of performance because people you walk into a room even if you're in a suit at 230 pounds and everybody's like, nope, you know, you only, you only can, can fit so many lanes, mm -hmm. but the best you can do is take the opportunities you have. And then, okay, this is a big guy, but why? And, and if I get on set and if you talk with a director and you've done all your work and you've, you found your why and the director says, but I just need you to be big, being prepared is fine. Throw it away and just be big, but at least you got that ace in your back pocket if you need it. When they tell you to improvise, you know, when they tell you to do some stuff and, and um, okay, you know, you just, just feel it like Judd, just uh, take one for you. And you're just riffing with one of the, the best comedic minds in the world of, of Amy Schumer and going back and forth. And because I know the why, I'm familiar with the story. It's, uh, again, I, I, I'm so sorry I draw all things back to WWE, but I don't, <laughs> totally fine. I don't plan a lot of stuff that I do. Anyone who works with me, it's, it's, um, I used to think WWE veterans were lazy when they said, I'll see you out there. We'll just figure it out out there. They weren't lazy. They were sharp. And they understood that it's a moving beast out there. And you have to be, your timing has to be better than your flawless choreography. It's not how sharp you do something. It's exactly when you do it. But you have to know your story. Okay, the story of this match is, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. You're not going to do anything. I'm going to win because we're trying to make me look strong. I can do that in 25 minutes. I can do that in three minutes. If the story is, okay, it's an equal opportunity contest. And then I severely break the rules to establish that I'm a better performer, which I'm not because I was dastardly to do that. And then we get to the point where we've had too much and I'm too cocky and here you come and you win. Well, you can do that in five minutes. You can do that in 60 minutes. But as long as you know the, the why and you can be prepared with a bunch of other stuff that you never use. But as long as you have it, sometimes the director, sometimes Vince or the, the powers of be will just, I just need you to go out there and be big. But I still got a bunch of ammo in, in case I need it, you know? That's a very beautiful answer. And I, I think we're coming up on our time. So I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to get too far past that, but I do want to, sort of tr try and wrap a bow on it because you did, you mentioned a, a lot about staying present, staying grateful, but you, you also mentioned that you're, you know, you're hopping on a flight, you're hopping on a flight back next to, to the next fast movie. And then after that, who knows where you're hopping on a flight from. And you spent so much time in the WWE hopping on flights from one moment to the next. So I'm curious, looking back on everything and looking ahead, what what is the the secret to staying present? Because I know it's hard for people, young performance especially, to to not be worried about the next thing to stay present. So for you, how have you stayed present, and how do you continue to stay present throughout all of these experiences? Uh, I guess, uh, man, I, I I hate giving advice because everybody's got to find their own path. But if if young performers out there are concerned, 
I think a good place to start is great work begets opportunity. You will get another chance. I was not the WWE's first pick. I was their last pick and I was going to be fired. But they gave me one chance and then they gave me one more. And then they gave me free run on their Saturday show. And then they moved me to, to SmackDown. And then they moved me to Raw. And then more opportunities came and more opportunities came. And right when I thought, man, this is the zenith of all the opportunities, a whole nother door opens up. And the opportunity is you can come on in, but you got to start at zero. So you got to be brave enough to say, okay, uh, good work is going to begat opportunity because I tried this thing before and failed. And I remember having a, 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 a conversation, an honest conversation with my friend, confidant, somebody I love very much, Dan Bain, in 2009, I think it was. And uh, he's kind of responsible for all this madness. <laughs> and, and I looked him straight in the eye and said, Dan, we're never doing movies again, are we? And he's, you know, he's my agent. And, and he said, no, we're not. <laughs> And he was genuine because we, we work on honesty and we always have. But uh, even in his mind, he was like, no, we're not, but we'll find a way. Don't worry about it. Like we'll find what you love and we'll go after what you love. And in a very long way of doing things, here we are over a decade later. And it's, imagine that I love this all the time. I just needed, I needed to, I needed it taken from me to realize how much I love, you know, but I think, to young performers, just do the best you can. Don't worry about it being a hit. Uh, Vince McMahon gave me the best advice I've ever been given. Give your all to what you do. Promote absolutely to the utmost. Don't leave anything on the table and then move forward. If you give it your all, you can, there, you'll find a takeaway. You'll find what you can do better next time. If you give your all and you promote your all, there's a, there's a nugget there. But if you look back and like, ah, man, I didn't, um, I, I wish I'd, you know, like they're really, the, the nugget is I wish I'd have worked harder and you hate to have the opportunities end because you wish you'd have worked harder. Cause that's on you. You can work hard, you know, but if the yield is, well, um, you know, uh, maybe I should have been more open to feedback or, um, I learned about. Uh, how to operate in a streaming uh, scenario where I can, I can market differently or, or box office scenario, or uh, maybe next time I need to be a little bit, or I learned a little bit more about overseas marketing or I learned a little bit more about domestic commercial marketing, or I, I made some mistakes in the press that now I can correct the next time I'm out there. Like there's something to learn all the time, but it's, it's, if you go at it a hundred percent, if, if, if you come up short because of your own accord, the, the, it's going to be tough to find the takeaways. Uh, and, and how to stay present, just realize that you're, you're in a job where you perform. There's a lot of folks out there that, that work to have time to enjoy. I'd like to think that everyone that gets a chance to perform enjoys performing. So your work is something you enjoy. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. And that's, that's in its totality. Don't just enjoy the good days. It's like a, a, proper, a, a functional relationship. If you get into a relationship and you think that it's not work, you're wrong, but it's work to enjoy the good and you got to enjoy the bad. You got to embrace the bad. You got to work through the bad. You can't bail. So, um, I don't know, do good, do good work and enjoy it. John, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know that you're, you're a very busy man these days. Uh, and so I really appreciate not only taking the time, but, but taking so much time and, and, and really giving such thoughtful answers. And, and I think it all, it all, I, it sounds like, you know, people people think what they will about professional wrestling but it feels like you you learned everything you learned in the wrestling ring and i find that fascinating i am i say this all the time uh there will come a time when i'll be able to thank the wwe audience for all that they've taught me and that's not just from a professional standpoint uh like they 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 made me into the man i am straight up and uh especially in lessons of like humility and failure persistence uh, the, countless, countless things that they never will understand. And, and when I hear something from you about like, Hey, I watched WrestleMania 21 or, uh, uh, Austin theory, for example, of like, I watched John Cena as a kid and he's never got to give up, got me through a lot of stuff. And that's why I'm here now. I don't think he realizes what he did for me. I don't think you realize what you did for me. And 
it's not just from a professional. I, I, I reference WWE in my daily life. It's something I'm forever grateful for because it's made me into the man that I am. Just don't bother you in the bathroom. Just maybe just wait until you're t- till you're done outside the bathroom to tell you that. Uh, hey, man, you uh, as long as you're aware that that's what's going on. <laughs> but a lot of people, when you tell them, they're like, oh, I didn't even realize. Yeah. And I go, okay, all right. And and that's I think that's where the I'm trying to have more empathy with that going forward. Incredible. Well, John, again, thank you so much. And uh, I, I do expect an update on the fast in your seatbelt situation, uh, but we can we can take that off, Mike. It's a safety measure. It makes sense on so many levels. <laughs> yeah. It's a PSA. It's for the greater good. There you go. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter, at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.